This is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. So a quick announcement before we start. Earlier this year, I went to the TED conference in Vancouver and I gave a talk about flag design. It was an incredible experience. And even though there was a little bit of skepticism when I started the talk, you know, when everyone learned that it was really going to be about flag design, the talk totally won over the crowd and I got a standing ovation. It was a real highlight of my career. And last week, the video was finally released. So I really hope everyone who listens to the show will go watch it and share it. You're going to dig it. The cool part is that it let me perform the talk like a radio piece instead of the normal TED Talk. I'm sitting down and playing audio clips and talking over music. And for once, you get to you know, see my face while I do it. If you've been listening to 99% Invisible for a while, you know that one of the thorns in my side is the city flag of San Francisco. If you're not familiar with that flag, you'll see it in the video. It's not good. Anyway, 99PI has some fans at the company Autodesk. And if you don't know Autodesk, all you need to know is this. If the thing you're looking at exists in three dimensions in the real world, that object was probably designed on Autodesk software. So Autodesk has this big office in San Francisco, and they saw the TED Talk and suggested that we partner together to help plan a redesign of the San Francisco flag. I'm really excited. We have a website, sanfranciscoflag.com. You can watch the TED Talk there, sign up, learn more, get involved. That's sanfranciscoflag.com. Please visit it, watch the video, share the link. I am trying to get my TED Talk to become the most watched TED Talk in history. So we just need 33 million more views to get there. So if each of you who download the show, watch the video between 60 and 70 times, we can make it. Or you can just share it a lot and make your friends watch it. All right. Thanks so much. This is 99% Invisible. I'm Roman Mars. The office of the chief medical examiner in Baltimore, Maryland, is a busy place. Anyone who dies unexpectedly in the state of Maryland will end up there for an autopsy. On an average day, they might perform 12 autopsies. On a heavier day, they might do more than 20. The building is six stories tall. Around 80 people are employed there. All day long, police are coming in and out. People are calling about their deceased loved ones. The press is calling with inquiries. But there's this one room on the fourth floor that sits apart from the buzz of normal activity in the building. Producer Katie Mingle was just there in Baltimore. This room feels a bit more like an art gallery because, well, it is kind of an art gallery. It houses the nutshell studies, which are these miniature dollhouse-like dioramas, and each one is a different scene. There's a kitchen, a log cabin, a barn, a bathroom. There are 18 different scenes. And each scene has different tiny features, tiny furniture, tiny windows and doors and lamps. And there are also tiny people, dolls, in each scene. And all of the tiny people in these scenes have one thing in common. They're all dead. When you look at a nutshell diorama, you're looking for clues about how the person or persons died. Was it a suicide, a homicide, an accidental death? The gun's there. You're obviously going to get a lot of evidence off the gun. So why would someone that came in to murder them, why would they leave a gun if they knew that that's going to happen? So I said a minute ago that the nutshell room is usually a quiet sanctuary in an otherwise busy office. And it is, usually. But this week, there are quite a few people in here. They're mostly police, a few FBI, and they're here for a week-long seminar on homicide investigation. One of the other theories is that, you know, maybe he, op- he wakes up. While they're there, the attendees will hear speakers, they'll see an autopsy, and they'll be broken into groups and assigned a nutshell diorama. At the end of the week, they'll be asked to present their theories of what happened in their dioramas. This group is looking at one of the few multi-room nutshell studies. And then he stumbles in here. He's uh, crawling at this point, gets in the bed, and then falls, and that's where he dies. But he drags the comforter under him? He might have thrown it off beforehand. Now, most nutshells are just one room and about the size of a shoebox. This one is a little bigger. It has three rooms plus a porch. It's in a glass case, so you can look down and see the interior of the house from above. He, He doesn't 
eject the round until it comes into the, in the baby's room. I think there's a The scene is of a lovely, well-kept suburban home. There are lace doilies on the tables, flower print linoleum in the kitchen, and blood everywhere. In the bedroom, a husband and wife are dead from gunshot wounds. In another room, a baby has been shot dead in her crib. Blood is spattered all over the pink wallpaper. It's a gruesome scene. The neighbor is dead. It was just supposed to be a murder-suicide with him and his wife, and he wanted the neighbors because he knows the neighbors are going to come in the morning. The seminar that brought these folks here has been happening every year for the last 70 years. And the person who started it is the same person who made the little death scene dioramas. Her name was Frances Glesner Lee, and her work in the field of forensics has shaped just about everything that happens inside the office of the chief medical examiner in Baltimore, Maryland. To tell her story, I want to introduce you to a couple of people. Medical examiner's office. Oh, you can call our investigations department. Let me give you the. That's Bruce Goldfarb. And I'm the executive assistant to the chief medical examiner for the state of Maryland. And this is Corinne. Hi, I'm Corinne Botts. I'm an artist and photographer, and I'm the author of The Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death. Corinne spent seven years researching Francis Glesner Lee. So Francis Glesner Lee would have loved the opportunity to study medicine and go on to college, but her parents were not supportive of that. This was around 1900. Women weren't really going to medical school. Her brother got to go, though. Of course. And he brought a friend home once, a guy by the name of George McGrath. Who was a pioneering medical examiner. McGrath and Lee became great friends. And when he'd come to visit, he'd tell her stories about cases he was working on. And she was just absolutely fascinated. She loved it. Now, Lee came from a wealthy Chicago family. She was supposed to be a proper society lady with lady hobbies, like needlework. So her interest in death wasn't really encouraged by her family, which meant for years she quietly studied it. She was a voracious reader, um, you know, talking to experts, getting firsthand experience by going to crime scenes. And then came to realize that people were getting away with murder, literally. Police would routinely botch investigations. They would contaminate crime scenes, move bodies, do things that today would be obviously, you know, don't do that. Uh, But at the time, they didn't know any better. And beyond that, the police just didn't know how to get information from these scenes. You know, they might not realize the significance of, uh, you know, a pile of cigarettes or um, the positioning of a firearm. And the other thing was, autopsies either weren't being done at all or were being done by doctors with no specific training in forensics. Eventually, Lee's parents and her brother passed away. She was in her 50s by then, and she finally had access to the family money and agency to do what she wanted. So in 1936, she gave a bunch of money to Harvard University to establish uh, the first program in legal medicine to train doctors and make them medical examiners. And then in 1945, Lee starts and presides over these week-long training seminars for police, the ones that are still going on today. She wanted to teach police, among other things, how to gather clues from a crime scene. Of course, in terms of legalities and time constraints, they weren't actually able to visit a crime scene during the seminars. So Lee decides she'll build miniature death scenes for the police to study. Each one will be based on a real death. She'll call them the nutshell studies of unexplained death. Basically, she would come up with the concept and the design, and her carpenter would draw the the blueprints, um, a scale of an inch to a foot. Lee's carpenter built the structures, framed the rooms exactly as you would a real life-size room. Real studs, real doors with real locks that worked. Lee handled all the figures and the textiles, the rugs and drapes and tiny clothes on the tiny figures. Finally, those society lady skills were being put to use. She would knit the stockings with needles the size of straight pins using a magnifying glass. And of course, she could only work for like a few seconds before her eyes would fatigue. The figures in the nutshells also sometimes show rigor mortis, which is a post-mortem stiffening of the body, and lividity, which is the way the blood pools or settles in the body after death. Both provide clues as to how and when a person died. The detail in the nutshells is bordering on obsessive. In one, an ashtray overflows with tiny cigarettes made with real tobacco, hand-rolled by Lee herself, each one burned and then stubbed out. The coffee pot she has, there's a strainer inside and coffee grounds in it. 
they're full of extraneous information because that's the way real life is. You know, you, you go into somebody's home, they could have a, a, a bag of drugs uh, and a weapon over here and die of a heart attack. It may or may not mean anything. Frances Glesner Lee spared no expense on her dioramas. Like she sort of lavished love onto these brutal crime scenes. Each one took about six months and around $6,000 to build. That's about the same amount of time and money it would cost to build a real house in the 1940s. Lee felt like if the policemen looked at them and saw any fault or didn't take them seriously, you know, they wouldn't learn from them. So that's why she felt like everything had to be done perfectly. Of course, Frances Glesner Lee was always trying to be taken seriously in the all-male world she had entered. She was ultimately both respected and adored by the police that she worked with. The week-long seminars she led were thought to be the best training homicide detectives could receive. And they're still thought of that way, actually, even today. After Frances Glesner Lee died in 1962, the programs she funded at Harvard, including the week-long seminars, were ended, and the nutshells were put in storage possibly headed for the trash. And then the medical examiner in Baltimore at the time, a guy named Russell Fisher, who was a former student of Lee's programs at Harvard, stepped in and said, We'll do it. We'll do the seminar. You know, we'll just pick it up here in in Maryland. And they brought the nutshells down. And so it's been the seminar and the nutshells have been used here since uh, 1968. Going up. The building that houses the medical examiner's office in Baltimore is fairly new. It was built in 2010. Bruce is giving me a tour of the building. It has some pretty unique features, including a full-size apartment that investigators can use to stage death scenes. Uh, Back behind us, we got a little dining area, kitchen. Bruce refers to it as a life-size nutshell study and the most violent room in Baltimore. This is the most violent room in Baltimore. They also have a parking garage that, in an emergency, can quickly turn into a huge morgue. And they have a biosafety facility to deal with death from highly contagious diseases. This is a whole isolation suite, and it has its own power generation, its own ventilation, its own drainage. As we walk around the autopsy floor, the second floor, I'm on high alert. I'm basically terrified of running into something I'm not prepared to see or smell. You have to go through the decamp area. If you want to stop and turn around, it's absolutely fine with Wait, that. Wait, what is that? What am I going to, what's going to happen? Like, I'll see some stuff or I'll no, smell some stuff? smell some stuff. Whoa, 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 hold it together, Mingle. Be cool. I know, totally not being cool. But we go through and it's fine. I mean, yes, there are dead bodies. And I have many existential feelings about that that I won't share here. But mainly this place feels like a really clean hospital for dead people. It feels like, yeah, this is how it should be. Francis believed in science-based death investigation. The, the whole institution, top to bottom, I think is probably uh, the fullest embodiment of her philosophy and her approach. Bruce is talking, of course, about Francis Glesner Lee. He says not only is this building an embodiment of her philosophies, but so is the whole Maryland system for dealing with death investigation. If you die unexpectedly in the state of Maryland, your death is likely to undergo a thorough investigation, including an autopsy by a medical examiner with specific forensic training. But this is not what you get everywhere. Depending on where you die, you could end up in a facility like Maryland's, or you could literally end up on a makeshift table in someone's garage. From state to state and even county to county, there can be huge variations in quality. And there are definitely no federal regulations. There's a lot of substandard work, unfortunately, being done in that field. It's not like CSI. It's not like what you see on TV very often. That's A.C. Thompson. He did a bunch of reporting on this for ProPublica a few years ago. Very often, it's people working under dismal conditions, for very little money, with very little oversight. When someone dies in the U.S., an authority has to issue a death certificate with a cause of death. If you die from an illness in a hospital, this is something your doctor would do. If you die unexpectedly, like if you're murdered or fall down some steps, 
a death certificate is issued by either a coroner or a medical examiner. Maryland is on a medical examiner system. South Carolina, Colorado, and several other states are on coroner systems. And then you have states that are a weird mix of both, depending on what county you're in. And Francis Glesner Lee was actually really passionate about abolishing coroners in favor of medical examiners. Because, well, I don't know if she would have put it like this, but basically... The coroner system is crazy. It's, it's bonkers, and it's an ascientific thing from another era. First of all, you don't necessarily have to be a doctor to be a coroner. That is, to be the person who issues a death certificate with a cause of death. Like, I'm a high school graduate, and a lot of places I could just roll out and say, oh, I'm running for coroner, and be the county coroner. Now, I would typically work with an MD who would do the autopsies, but I'd be the one who would make the final decision. And that's the other thing. The coroner is an elected office. When you have medical professionals, or even non-medical professionals, who have to run for office based on what happens in the morgue, sets up potential conflicts of interest. One of the situations where you might see conflicts of interest are cases where someone dies in police custody. AC actually did some reporting on this very thing in New Orleans. And what you see in New Orleans over and over and over again is that when people died in police custody or when people died in jail custody, there would be pretty good evidence that something untoward had happened. They'd been neglected, they'd been severely beaten, they'd been attacked. And what was happening was the coroner there was basically trying to pretend that these things didn't happen. He was ruling deaths to be accidental that should have been ruled as homicides. His name was Frank Minyard. He actually was a doctor, but he wasn't trained as a medical examiner. He was an OBGYN. And he seemed to have a bias toward protecting the police, maybe because he constantly had to campaign to keep his job. Who does he want to endorse him? Well, he wants the police to endorse him. And if he's got a big spat with the police, is that going to look good for voters? In New Orleans, the FBI finally stepped in and did some of their own investigations, and some police did eventually go to jail for some of those deaths. But Minyard was never fired by the voters or anyone else. He served as coroner for 40 years and finally retired in 2014. So it's worth noting when you're talking about incidents involving the police, that if the police shoot somebody, the coroner or medical examiner is going to say, It was a homicide. You can't really get around that. And then the question will be, is it justified or not? But then there are cases that are less cut and dry. And those are the ones where an impartial scientific death investigation might matter the most. And actually, while I was in Baltimore, one of these cases was playing out. You probably heard about it. For a second day in Baltimore, a demand for answers into how 25-year-old Freddie Gray suffered a fatal spinal cord injury while in police custody. Freddie Gray sustained his fatal injury on April 12th. He died a week later on the 19th. And for days after his death, people protested and waited to see if the state's attorney, Marilyn Mosby, would bring charges against the police involved in the incident. And Mosby was waiting, too. She was waiting to see how the medical examiner would rule the death. As soon as she got their findings, she made her announcement. The findings of our comprehensive, thorough, and independent investigation, coupled with the medical examiner's determination that Mr. Gray's death was a homicide, which we received today, has led us to believe that we have probable cause to file criminal charges. We don't know if the officers charged in Freddie Gray's death will be convicted, but they were charged. And for a lot of people, this was an important first step. I had left Baltimore by the time the medical examiner's office released their findings on Freddie Gray. But I have to say that having just been there and seen the way they do things, I felt pretty confident in their process. It felt like their findings would be based in science and not tied to politics. And... I don't think it's a stretch to say that Frances Glesner Lee had something to do with that. You know, if she were to walk around, see what we do, how we do things here, I think she'd be very pleased. And, you know, she really is, um, I don't know if we believe in guiding spirits or that sort of thing, but she is very definitely a presence here. 
um, uh, every day. At the end of the Francis Glesner Lee seminar and homicide investigation, the attendees present their theories about what happened in each of their nutshell studies, and then they get to find out the actual solutions. Was it a homicide staged to look like a suicide? Or a suicide staged to look like a homicide? Or something else entirely? This is the folder that contains the solutions to the nutshells. Dun, 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 dun. The guy that has the answers to these questions might be the most Baltimore guy I met in Baltimore. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Jerry Jechihovich, uh, also known as Jerry D. Sometimes the police will come up with their own solution. And since they're all wearing guns, I don't challenge them to say you're wrong. I just say that's not how Francis saw it. But I do have the, yeah, the answers. Jerry D. is not going to let me see the folder or record when he tells the solutions. They guard the nutshell secrets like the recipe for Coke or the code for the Google search algorithm because they're still valuable secrets. As long as the solutions aren't easily searchable, the nutshells are still great tools for teaching homicide investigation. And that is something that the medical examiner's office in Baltimore, Maryland takes very, very seriously. Thanks to everyone at the office of the Chief Medical Examiner in Baltimore, Maryland, especially Bruce Goldfarb, for letting us come to visit. Corinne Botts' book, The Nutshell Studies of Unexplained Death, is full of amazing photographs of the nutshells, some of which you can see on our website is 99pi.org. Being that this is the uh, 70th anniversary, in order to celebrate, we've actually had a 70th anniversary challenge coin made with Francis Glesner Lee on the back and um, Harvard Associates on the front. Yep, Katie got a Francis Glesner Lee challenge coin when she was there, and Avery is so jealous. Make sure you coin check Katie when you see her. percent Invisible was produced this week by Katie Mingle with Sam Greenspan, Avery Truffleman, and me, Roman Mars. We are a project of 91.7 KALW San Francisco and produced out of the offices of ArcSign, an architecture and interiors firm in beautiful downtown Oakland, California. You can find this show and like the show on Facebook. All of us are on Twitter, Instagram, and Spotify. But to find out more about this story, including cool pictures and links, and listen to all the episodes of 99% Invisible, you must go to 99pi.org. Radiotopia from PRX.